This conference will now be recorded. Yes, just a reminder that this conference will be recorded. Um, so I'm here representing Geo Blue Planet, and Geo stands for the Group on Earth Observations. And Blue Planet is the coastal and ocean initiative of Geo, and we connect ocean and coastal observations with society. Um, so today we have session one on current knowledge and understanding of climate change impacts of, on tuna fisheries. Um, and I'm joined by a fantastic panel on scientists that are studying tuna and fisheries around the world. So today I have Francis Marsak at IRD, Hassan Mustafid at NOAA, Maite Eroskin at AZTI, and Johan Bell at Conservation International. Um, I'm also joined by Emily Smale, who is the executive director of Geo Blue Planet. And in the event my internet goes out, which my internet provider said that it would, um, she's here to moderate the session. There she is. So I said this is session one um, of our Earth Observations for Tuna Fisheries Management Workshop Series. And there are four other um, sessions after this one um, between the months of November and December. So if you are interested in attending the rest of the sessions, please visit our website at geoblueplanet.org slash EO for tuna. Um, and it's the same registration as you signed up for today's event. So now I'd like to welcome Maite Eroskin. Hello, good morning. I think I need to make you a presenter. Yeah. I can't share my screen yet. You can now share your screen. Yeah. So Dr. Maite Eroskin is a postdoctoral researcher with AZTI in Spain and is working on climate change and its effect on ecosystems and fisheries. She graduated with honors in marine sciences in Vigo's University in 2012. She has her master's in marine ecology from CICES in Mexico, 2015, and has a PhD in marine and environmental resources. From in 2020 from the University of Basque Country. She has experience on species distribution models, um, including the Zombie Horizon 2020 project. And her collaborations include important working groups in modeling and related with climate change impacts. Um, and she also started a collaboration with Fish MIP or Fish MIP Worldwide Initiative. Um, and with that, I welcome Maite to give her presentation on large scale distribution of tuna and build fishes in a warming ocean. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Leah, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to be here. And today, as Leah said, uh, I will give a talk about the distribution of tuna and fishes in a warming ocean. And those are the results of two studies that we conducted last year, where we analyzed the impacts of climate change in the past. And using habitat models, we project the change into the future for mid at the end of the century. So as you all know, climate change has a significant impact across all marine ecosystems, uh, latitude and trophic levels. And there are many studies about the implications of the global warming in a species distribution, abundance changes, and also in phenology alterations to maintain the ecological niches. As an example, we will have other talks from Francis and Hassan later about the climate change impacts on tuna in the, um, in the Indian Ocean. But there are, there are other many uh, studies that analyze the impacts in the past and also explore the change uh, in the future under different climatic scenarios. So in this study, uh, we focus on the main seas commercial tuna species and billfish. Uh, from the billfish, we only had the sword fishing species. Um, why those species? Because they are very important in terms of fisheries and economy. The pelagic species comprise the largest proportion of the global marine, nearly the 20%. And tuna and bill fishes, as part of large pelagic group, support one of the most important fisheries worldwide, uh, in both terms in landings and economic value. 
Uh, besides, tuna uh, is an important source of protein in many countries. And it's contemplated as a possible adaptation to fill the gap of enriched food availability and food security in next years. And in addition, tuna and billfishes are top predators living in the pelagic environment, and they play a very important ecological role in many regions due to their top-down influence on ecosystem structure. And they are all oceanic and highly migratory and are distributed worldwide. Those are the reasons that why we choose those species. So due to the socioeconomic and ecological value of tuna species, uh, understanding and predicting the responses to the global change is, uh, is an important task for scientists and also for stakeholders to design effective management plans for, of course, for predator populations and for human societies that depend on them and to try to avoid or mitigate the climate change impacts. In this context, the objectives of the study were to investigate the effect of the environmental conditions uh, on the worldwide distribution of the cistuna species and swordfish between 1958 and 2004, and project the changes by mid and the end of the century under the worst climatic scenario, the RCP 8.5. Uh, with those purposes, we built the tuna habitat models for the present or the reference period. Uh, then we analyzed the historical trends between 1958 and 2004 um, to see if there were any shift in the distribution or change in the abundances. And then we projected changes for mid and the end of the century. And we also analyzed changes in tuna habitat within the country's exclusive economic zones that in after the EECs to assess the potential impact for the coastal countries. Um, the findings should contribute to understand the potential impacts of climate change on tuna and billfish fisheries and also to the fishing nations. So in recent years, to analyze species changes and predict the future scenarios, the predictive modeling has become increasingly important and there are many different models, but the models that we use in this study are based on the ecological niche concept of Hutchinson, which defines the niche as the variety of different environmental conditions that are represented as an hyperbilum for which the organism is, is best suited. And also, theories further suggest that the organisms might occupy the space to, in order to minimize the competition with other organisms. So, among different niche based models, there are different ones, but we choose the general additive models or GAMS uh, because they have the ability to handle with the non-linear data uh, and help in development of ecological models that better represent the, the, those data and also to increase the understanding of ecological systems. The, as an input, we use the Japanese fleet catch per unit for data between 1958 and 2004 with a five per five spatial resolution. Um, as they are catching data, and we had only occurrences or presence, uh, but no absence. So the absence were uh, randomly generated worldwide, uh, excepting the points in land and points where already were presences. And the number of pseudo absence were generated in balance with the number of the presence. Then, uh, the, as in also inputs, uh, we use the predictors uh, that were extracted for, from Pisces biogeochemical model with a one per one spatial resolution and the same time series as the CPU data. The ecological niche models were built relating the catches data with the different environmental variables such as sea surface temperature, salinity, mixed layer tech, phytoplankton, and others. And predictions were made over an ensemble of 16 species, uh, sorry, 16 uh, biochemical models for the present uh, or the reference period that I said before, which is considered the last 20 years of the last century, so between 1980 and 1999. Um, projections were uh, conducted for the mid century and uh, for the end of the century. Uh, for the business as usual is a climatic scenario, RCP 8.5. And the historical reconstruction was conducted using the same passes biogeochemical model. Those models have some limitations. Uh, for example, uh, we assume that the CPUE, which is the cache data, 
uh, is considered as a proxy of the abundance of the biomass because the Japanese fleet has the ability to move everywhere and follow the fish. And that's why I'm not going to say any more abundance, but I will use the relative abundance term uh, that uh, gives um, this assumption that CPUE is considered a proxy of the abundance. Also, those models are two-dimensional uh, models. We have no deep dimension, and there are some studies that say that tuna and swordfish can migrate in the vertical column. So probably we are missing uh, a lot of data in this um, in these two-dimensional models. There are no biological parameters that they should be include to have a more reliable model and interaction with other species of drivers. Um, an advantage of those global models is that we have a general view, but at the same time, some local patterns can be lost. But despite all the limitations, those tools are very useful to improve the understanding of climate change impacts over the target species. And I will show you the, the results of the, those studies. Here you can see the habitat models for each species from the present or reference period being the red color uh, more suitable habitat or higher relative abundance uh, following the assumption mentioned before and the black circles represent the catches data being the size proportional to the value um, using the response curve from the GAN models um, showed before we reconstructed the historical time series for each species and here you can see a uh, yearly reconstruction of the yellowfin tuna in an animation. I don't know if you can see the animation. It goes with a little bit delay, just to let you know. And um, once that the historical reconstruction has been conducted, uh, a common approach to detect uh, the species range shift is to investigate the geographical center of the population called the center of gravity. We estimated for uh, each species stocks. In this case, the six tuna species were introduced in the analysis, and the six species are divided in 21 stocks. Then uh, we can define the center of gravity as the geographical point that describes the center point of the region's population. And we also estimated the fifth and 95th percentiles for the south and the north boundary limits. But in this graphic, you only, uh, the, only the center of gravity is represented. For each species, you can see it in different colors and different stocks that they are divided in different boxes. In all the red circles, uh, all the stocks have been shifted uh, significantly between 1958 and 2004. Uh, and in the orange circles, some of the stocks have significant trends and others not. And the, just to remark, the highest shifting rate was found in the North Atlantic albacore stock. You can see it in the D box uh, for albacore. Um, it's complicated to see all the stock trends because I know that there are many, many lines, but there can be distinguished some general patterns. In the stocks in the North uh, Hemisphere shift northward in general, while the stocks in the South do it southward. It is not so clear for a stock divided like east-west, and also an opposite pattern than expected uh, was found in the southern bluefin. That this is uh, the K box with the green color uh, is in the south hemisphere and it uh, shifts northward. Um, the difference between the future period and the present uh, was represented. And in order to easily see the changes from the present period to the mid and the end of the century, the species habitats uh, were, um, were represent uh, as an improvement in green and deterioration in red, and hence the relative abundance like gains or losses. In the animation, you can see alternatively the changes for mid uh, and the end of the century with higher changes uh, for the end of the century than for the mid century. Um, we can see how for temperate tunas, tropical big eye and swordfish loses are expected mainly in the tropical areas. Uh, they have a slight uh, gains or improvements in the distribution limits in the temperate areas, while for the tropical skipjack and yellowfin, a general increase is expected uh, 
and we can say that chasing environmental conditions seems to benefit them in the future. So to see how those environmental changes could affect different countries, we estimated changes for both future periods comparing with the present period inside the exclusive economic zones. And for that, we applied a mask over our models, as you can see in the right down graphic. Um, re uh, relative abundance gains and losses for each coastal country were estimated. But I'm not going uh, into details. I just would like to give you an overall view of the patterns that we found. And in the figure, each column represents each tuna species changes. In red, they are represented the losses, and in green, the gains again. And each bar represents a country which are organized by latitude. Um, as the particular cases are not important here, I, I only left the latitudinal pattern to see and I removed the names. Um, the black bars represent changes for the mid century and the gray ones for the end of the century, which in most of the cases have the same pattern, but just with higher values. So that means that all changes are expected to be more extreme for the end of the century than for the mid century. Um, for both bluefin species, mainly the uh, decrease is expected in both future periods. Uh, for the big eye and albacore, um, they are expected to have losses in the equatorial areas with uh, some gains in their distribution boundaries countries, as we can see in the red circles. And in the other side, we have the tropical skipjack and yellowfin that are projected to, to gain, mainly in the equatorial areas. However, um, I would like to remark that the, those are the broad results and it would be more appropriate to carry out a more exhaustive analysis with regional or local models. And I think that there is a next talk by Johan Bell with, which cover the socioeconomic impact of the climate change in Tuna in much more detail. So to summary the results, we found a poleward trends of most of the tuna stocks habitat between 1958 and 2004, with the highest rate in the North Atlantic. And in the future, uh, and under the worst climatic scenario, an expansion of the distribution areas is expected, mainly in the distribution limits, so in the temperate areas, with a decrease in suitability in the equatorial areas for temperate tunas, big eye, and small fish. Uh, however, the environmental conditions changes seems to be beneficial for the tropical yellowfin and skipjack, which will improve their habitats, uh, suitability, and the relative abundance in the future. Uh, all those distribution changes affect differently to the coastal countries, uh, following this latitudinal pattern that uh, shows the, the species. And just to remind that all those estimated changes are due to changes in the environment, but there are many other drivers and interactions that could, uh, could affect them. And all those results are from those two papers that you can see here, where the methodology and the further results are better explained. And before finishing, I would like to thank to every funding source that allowed me to do this research and of the, all the researchers that helped me, principally my supervisors, Guillermo and Aritz. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much for giving us that overview of the past and future projections of um, distributions of tuna species around the world. Um, if you have any questions for Maite, please save it for the end. We have two more presentations and then we'll have about 30 minutes for discussion. Right. Next, I have Francis Marsak and Hassan Mustafid. And Francis. Yes, uh, yes. I <coughs> apologize for the delay. I have a very terrible connection uh, from, from office. So I'm doing that from home and it uh, looks much better. Um, well, uh, just tell me how to uh, switch my uh, presentation on screen. Okay. Okay, I can see. So I've made you a presenter. Yes, I can see your PowerPoint. Okay, thank right. you. So Dr. Francis Marsac is a senior fisheries oceanographer at IRD, the French Research Institute for Sustainable Development. His research interests encompass tuna fisheries, seabird ecology, seamounts, 
ocean climate indicators, and the climate change effects on marine ecosystems. From 2010 to 2018, he managed the joint French and South African ICEMASA Laboratory, the International Center for Education, Marine, and Atmospheric Sciences over Africa um, at the University of Cape Town, where he, he became a research associate. In September 2020, he was posted in the Seychelles as the IRD representative to strengthen the partnership in marine sciences with the Seychelles Fishing Authority and to participate in training and supervision of students at the University of Seychelles. Um, he was also the chair of the Scientific Committee of the Indian Ocean Tuna Commission from 2006 to 2011, and is currently coordinating the French component of the second international Indian Ocean Expedition. Um, along with his several books and book chapters, he's also served as a scientific advisor for two documentaries on tuna fisheries. Francis is joined by Dr. Hassan Mustafid, uh, who is a fisheries oceanographer with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration in the US Integrated Ocean Observing System. He leads several projects to improve ocean observing systems to support IU societal benefits. Most recently, he has served as the Senior Fisheries Resource Officer for the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. In his capacity, he leads the UN FAO efforts to deliver global fisheries assessments, develop and implement the large marine ecosystems, lead the deep sea fisheries in areas beyond national jurisdiction programs, and the impacts of climate change on fisheries, and advanced fisheries science through emerging observing technologies. Um, so Francis and Hassan will present their work on observed and projected climate change effects on tuna fisheries in the Western Indian Ocean. Thank you, Lee, for this introduction. Uh, good day to everyone. Well, uh, as you see on the title, this talk um, is intended to provide some insights on climate-induced changes that are projected in the Indian Ocean and their effects on tuna fisheries. And this, this synthesis has been prepared, as you can see, with uh, Hassan Mustafi from uh, Norway. So now a quick uh, outline. Uh, it takes a while to go to the following slide, I don't know why. Yes. Okay, so a quick outline, it's a uh, show that will go through the uh, economic importance of tuna fisheries in the West Indian Ocean and with uh, an emphasis on the small island developing uh, states, seeds. Then we'll uh, review the observed changes through the Indian Ocean dipole, uh, the response uh, to these uh, Indian Ocean dipoles change and then we'll uh, do the forecast, the projected changes, and uh, we'll finish with the vulnerability of uh, uh, small island developing states economy. So actually, there is no debate uh, on the fact that the tuna fishery sector is of prime importance for the, in the West Indian Ocean. It represents 9% of the marine growth products with in industrial and semi-industrial components that make the bulk of this contribution. Um, it's 18% of the global tuna catch, which is caught in the West Indian Ocean, making this region the second largest fishing area in the world. Tuna fisheries play a key role uh, in the economy of, uh, of seeds. Um, and for instance, they, they can represent up to 10% of the labor force. 30% of the gross uh, domestic product and 95% of domestic exports in the Seychelles, which is much ahead of what we have in Mauritius and Maldives. So we're going to uh, examine now one indicator of climate variability, uh, which is the uh, Indian Ocean dipole. So this dipole, as you can see on the sketch, is a reversal of inside of the SST anomalies across the Indian Ocean. This reversal is uh, so striking that uh, the dipole can be uh, summarized by a simple index time series. We describe the difference in SST, sea surface temperature anomaly, between the tropical western Indian Ocean and the tropical southeastern Indian Ocean. So on the left, you have the positive phase with uh, anomalous easterly winds blowing along the equator. They lift the thermocline on the, on the east part of the Indian Ocean. And uh, by contrast, we have a, a, a downwarding on, on the west part. We have heavy rainfall hitting uh, East, uh, East Africa. 
Then uh, in the negative phase, obviously, the, the opposite occurs with uh, westerlies along the equator, a downwelling in the east, and uh, increased convection uh, over Indonesia and Western Australia. So the time series of the IOD is shown here, 1950 to 2020. So we can see that the dipole events were rather periodic, occurring as a rather periodic before 2000, with a predominant five-year signal. After 2000, we see some kind of change. The periodicity tends to shorten at the dominant four-year cycle, and uh, the signal is more noisy than in the previous uh, period. Uh, we have 50% of the periodogram, which is below the two-year signal during the recent period, compared to 40% uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in the previous period, before 2000. So we can question what the kind of interaction we have between the, the Southern Oscillation Index, SOI, and the Dipole Mode Index. Um, so we have uh, some collinearity, collinearity uh, that is shown on the GAM plot on the, on the uh, right, uh, right side, which explains Rarely 30% of the variance. So the negative values uh, right here, negative SOI values, uh, tend to occur at the same time as uh, uh, positive dipoles. And the, in the opposite, uh, positive uh, SOI values, which reflect NIMIA, are more associated to negative uh, dipoles. For that, we, there are several remarkable uh, positive dipoles events which were not associated to any uh, strong uh, Nino events, like in the 1961 uh, or in the 1997-98. Um, actually, they were just uh, either coinciding with uh, no Nino or weak Ninos. So the, the, the trigger of the positive uh, dipole mode is, uh, is, uh, is an amplification of the seasonal upwelling of Java which then through air interaction stretches out to the north and to the west. Then the DMI is considered to better depict processes uh, that are more specific to the Indian Ocean rather than the SOI, especially uh, this connection with the monsoonal system of the Indian Ocean. So the odds of trend that we have for the uh, back to 1870s in the, in the 19th century is plotted by decay. We, it shows a, a gradual shift starting in the 1960s towards more frequent positive dipoles and those positive dipoles take over the negative dipoles from the 90s on. By contrast, the SOI doesn't exhibit such uh, any trend. Only decades were dominated by Nina events and decades like this one, 1999, dominated by, by Ninos. So this would indicate that the living process behind those indices are quite distinct. So let's focus on this recent trend of uh, positive uh, dipoles and let's see the, 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 the impact on, uh, on tuna uh, ocean and tuna fisheries. So in this maps, we show that uh, how important the West Indian Ocean has been actually, and is always still a waste for the, for the uh, bird chain uh, fishing in the, in the Indian Ocean since the beginning uh, of, the, of the fishery in the 1980s. There were some uh, surveys in the east as shown in the gray shades, but actually uh, the largest catch uh, are concentrated west of uh, 55 east. So the, how the ocean responded uh, will actually will make it very uh, simple. And we focus on three main variables which are uh, relevant to uh, fisheries, tuna fisheries. The first one is the uh, sea surface temperature. And you see the map on the, on the right in the, for October 2019, where the most recent dipole was being uh, was developing. Uh, you see the very uh, low uh, anomalies, uh, cold anomalies on the east, um, which are associated to uh, an opening, you know, minus three degrees of uh, Sumatra. And by contrast, in the west, uh, positive anomalies up to two degrees. And there is also a substantial warming in the southeasterly direction. So during, during the, the intense positive dipoles, we also note uh, a weakening of the submarine polling uh, that is represented here in the red uh, dots, uh, which uh, correspond to uh, dipole years. 
uh, I mean, the temperature is about one degree above uh, the average. So we also consider the depth of the thermocline, which is indicated by the 20 degrees uh, isothermal depth. So similar to temperature, you see a very clear dipole, east-west dipole, with the upwelling in the east and downwelling on the on the east. Uh, in terms of anomalies, this represents a kind of uh, 30, 40 meters of shoaling in the east and uh, down to 40 to 80 meters deeper in the west, which is huge. So since 1997, there were several main episodes with the deep thermocline in the west, and the most striking ones were in the 1997, in the very recent uh, 2019 uh, episode. So that's where we have uh, uh, experienced deep thermocline with uh, positive dipoles. Now we also have some response to, to investigate on the primary productivity. And uh, clearly the, 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 it's very clear that on the, on the West, associated to the warming, we have a, a reduction of the primary productivity and uh, opposite in the East with uh, extreme, um, that was in January in 1988, where you have a, a very high concentration of, of uh, chlorophyll. So, uh, what is interesting as well is to show the kind of uh, uh, alternating phase uh, in the chlorophyll concentration. So after this uh, very low value of minus 20% of chlorophyll found in the 97-98 Ninos, we have gone through what we call the golden years, uh, positive phase, which peaked in 2004. And then uh, with the uh, 2007 dipole, positive dipole, went back into a, a negative phase. And um, so, and that uh, lasted until 2014. And since 2015, we have a mild positive phase occurring. So we don't know yet if it will trigger, I mean, the, the, the positive dipole will trigger another negative phase in next year. So the fishery, the tuna fishery responds to such changes. In the left plot, we show the normal special pattern of uh, tuna catch by percentage, let's say January which is concentrated on the shallow thermocline indicated in blue between zero and 10 south. So now in January 98 on the, on the right, you can see that no more catches were made on the west, but they were all concentrated on the east on this uh, shallow, um, shallow uh, mixed layer um, area. Uh, I mean, the, so the, 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 the depth of the thermocline is important for bird sailors because when thermocline is too deep, uh, the fish can escape below the net. Uh, opposite, you know, when you have a very shallow thermocline, the, the, the fish is more or less trapped in the upper layers. So interestingly, we find that this uh, oscillation in the chlorophyll can also be uh, seen, uh, generate some signals in the in the recruitment. Here, that's the skidjack. So the skidjack stock was uh, assessed just uh, uh, one month ago at the IOTC, and. Uh, the recruitment is, uh, curve is shown in blue. That was uh, produced by a stock synthesis three model, a population model. And then the, the, the chlorophyll concentration is represented in, uh, in red. So we can see the same um, uh, golden years in the recruitment series. And uh, this uh, depleted uh, recruitment corresponding to a low uh, chlorophyll uh, content. And again, a kind of build up after 2015. So it is assumed that this link is mediated by the abundance in prey for tunas, such as uh, small pelagic fish, crustaceans, skiffalopods. So enhanced or depleted phytoplankton biomass will drive favorable or poor foraging condition for tunas. So, and the good condition obviously provides a sub substantial uh, survival and growth. So there were changes observed during the past three decades. Now we're going to see what is projected. So the climate models, uh, which are used by the in, in Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, now includes uh, marine biochemical chem chemical components uh, to explore the response of marine ecosystems to climate change under various scenarios. Here we use the most recent simulations on the CMIT-5 that's how major stretches of the ocean ecosystem may evolve through the 21st century. We only show the results from the, the RCP 8.5, which corresponds to the highest CO2 emissions. 
and the dots on the figures actually indicate convergent diagnostic from most models and prediction in those areas are then rated as the robust. So the SST on the left plot would increase from three to four degrees in the tropical Indian Ocean, north of 20 south. The largest magnitude would take place in the Somali Basin and Arabian Sea. Uh, such increase would cause SST to range from 29 to 31 degrees. In the East Indian Ocean, the temperature increase would be lesser, but we have to keep in mind this is the, this is the place of the Indian Ocean warm pool. So uh, even with a lesser uh, increase, the projected uh, temperature there will be in the range 31 to 32 degrees by the end of the century. Now for oxygen, ocean models predict a decline of one to seven percent of dissolved oxygen in the global ocean, uh, with a, a largest decline occurring in the extratropics and contributing to this expansion of uh, oxygen minimum zones. Well, in this plot, uh, we show that for the Indian Ocean, the changes are not uniformly uniform in, in especially, and the uh, agreement between models, repeated by the dots, is not as good as for temperature. But it clearly indicates that uh, uh, an extensive uh, depleted oxygen zone in the subtropical gyre, right here on the on the on the right, and uh, on the northernmost region of the Arabian Sea, might become anoxic uh, as below uh, below 2,000 meters. And um, as for the the the, the West uh, Indian Ocean, we show that uh, we would have uh, um, increased uh, oxygen concentrations which represent uh, by a ratio of 11 to 16 percent more than the current oxygen level at depth. Now for the net product, primary production, uh, it exhibits a, a rather a special, great special uh, heterogeneity. The striking feature is the strong decrease in the, in the West Indian Ocean, especially uh, along uh, the, uh, the Arabian, uh, Arabian coast. Um, in the in so in the, this whole region, the average uh, net primary production loss by 20, 2100 would represent a decrease of 50 percent of the actual production. So up there, it's a region where opening is normally well established during the southwest monsoon. But the projection in the net primary production at the end of the 21st century would be only 30 to 40 percent of the current level. So all this contributes to an expansion of unsuitable habitats. And in this particular case, we take the temperature, the temperature threshold was 31 degrees. So, uh, and this is shown how it will evolve over time with the years indicated with the colors. So the, the, in the short term from 24 to 2060, depending on the scenarios, the degradation of the skipjack habitat will take place in the central West Indian Ocean. Uh, on the RCP 8.5, which is the highest uh, CO2 emission scenario, the warm pool in the east would become suitable, unsuitable by 2050. So uh, such spread over time spreads to the north, Indian Ocean, but doesn't extend south of 10 degrees south. But the rate of change towards unfavorable habitat is greater in the west Indian Ocean compared to anywhere else. So we, um, these uh, projections were also investigated with the uh, Apicosm uh, ecosystem model, which is a model uh, designed and uh, run by, uh, by uh, Olivier Morin. So in this model, there is a combination of uh, metabolic rates, the environmental foreign, forcing and, uh, and fishing mortality, which uh, uh, produce a three uh, dimensional uh, representation of the biomass. At different time steps. So there we take the case for the for the skipjack. So there were projections uh, stated in two parts: first half, first half, and second half of the century. So in the first half, the model predicts an increase in biomass along the western edge of the Arabian Sea and along the northern limb of the subtropical gyre. By contrast, the abundance would decrease in the equatorial region of the Indian Ocean and even more in the in the West Pacific. So this increase of skipjack biomass by 2050 is most well marked in the Indian Ocean compared to the two other oceans as shown on, the, on this uh, uh, bar plot uh, on the right. Now, during the second half, we can see a profound change with an overall depletion in the Indian Ocean 
to the north of and south. Everything is coming blue. The latitude plots indicate that the transient uh, biomass increase by 2050 is relative to a movement of the skipjack biomass from the equator to the 10 north and 10 south uh, latitudes. By 2095, the model predicts that the higher biomass would return to the equator, that's the, the green line, but uh, with a depleted level compared to, to nowadays. So uh, we have attempted uh, to uh, produce a map uh, from a qualitative uh, expert system-based approach, which combined physiological constraints, environmental conditions for the survival of larvae and juveniles, and, uh, and operational requirements for pursing with regards to the environment. So this is the kind of a sketch of um, uh, relocation of the, the, the person fishery, which may occur during the century. So the density of schools may dwindle dramatically um, uh, around session on the, on the west area, but, uh, but it can state that person fishing would become technically impossible in the region. Still, yeah. the potential in new areas combining presence of tuna schools, less detrimental foraging condition and stratification would uh, be mostly uh, southwards and eastwards and uh, to some extent in the, in the northern area. So southwards would be in the South Mozambique Channel. We, we still have the mesoscalades, which are an active source of uh, biological production. To the southeast, along the northern lead of the subtropical gyre, 10 to 15 south. In this area, the models project a 4 to 25 percent reduction in oxygen below 200 meters, whereas the surface layers would not be too much affected. So we'll have a strong oxycline gradient, which would contain tunnels in the upper layers, making them more vulnerable to the person. Of Sumatra, this area would be favorable only in uh, very intense uh, positive dipoles, which trigger a pooling, as we've seen before. And in the northwest area, the, this region is rated as very unfavorable because of elevated SSP and dramatically reduced net primary production. Then we could expect a steady drop in the person catch and potentially landings in the Seychelles uh, by the second half of the century. However, because of elevated oxygen in the subsurface, tuna could find appropriate habitat in the deep, offering an opportunity for a continued industrial and semi-industrial fishing with long liners based in the Seychelles, operating from the Seychelles. So now a quick look at the economic impacts uh, of positive dipoles in the Seychelles. This is based on a study which was made in 2010 using a model of economic spillover incurred by the percentage of the expenditure uh, in the Port Victoria Seychelles. So the expenditure of uh, fishing vessels feed actually in the national economy, in the public, public sectors, and also uh, to the, in the Seychelles households. And this includes various revenues such as port fees, goods, community supply, services, and wages to workers. So it's a, it's a quite complex uh, set of, uh, of uh, information and uh, interaction to, to generate the impact on the, um, to, to, to estimate, to assess the impact on the local economy. But we not go further details in, in, in this model because I think Patrice Guillotro is uh, one of the coders here online and would be more qualified than myself to answer questions if needed. So essentially the model allows to quantify the induction coefficient and the relative contribution of induced direct and indirect effects. It is what is shown on the figure. So the average induction coefficient at two, around two, means that for every 100 rupees spent by the person to the fleet in Victoria, it leads to an amount of 200 rupees for the Seychelles economy. So it's a, it's a, it's a good, uh, good, uh, good rate, but in 1998, we show that for all three effects, we had a substantial detrimental impact caused by the dipole from 26 to 58% for the different uh, effects. So if you consider the, point, the drop of 40% in landings and in transship and during the two quarters which were constant, they resulted in a 34% loss for the local economy, which is substantial, especially for a country where uh, fishing is one of the two pillars along with uh, tourism. So um, we use actually the 
the uh, 1998 dipole in the study to mimic the kind of climate situation that may evolve in the 21st century. If no adaptation measures are taken, the projected ocean conditions would have a devastating effects on seed and especially in the West Indian Ocean. So what are the take home message? First of all, that strong anomalies such as driven by the Indian Ocean Dipole have caused alternating positive and detrimental impacts on the tuna fisheries in the West Indian Ocean. Second, the, the message is that we have a warmer and less a productive ocean in the equatorial region in the current first chain fishing grounds. And this will cause special shifts with uh, adverse impacts on the local economy of the seas. Well, the, the, the monitoring of ocean conditions and the projections of the ecosystem models should be considered in a more integrated manner as they can inform on possible adjustments in stock assessment methods and to refine the management advices. In this respect, Earth observations have the potential to support an adaptive and more holistic management of tuna fisheries. And uh, finally, the experience in monitoring and modeling needs to be shared widely across the scientific community, especially with the developing countries. Partnership is needed at all levels, and this is key to achieving the necessary capacity development and to assist in developing adaptations for a better resilience to climate change in the West Indian Ocean. Thank you for your attention. Great, thank you very much for that overview of um, the Indian Ocean, and I'm sure we'll have a great discussion about kind of different impacts on different fisheries in the region. Um, next, I invite um, Dr. Johan Bell. I've made you a presenter. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. So I'm, I'm happy to start if you'd like me to. Um, I don't see your screen yet. Oh, really? I thought I'd just um, share it there, but let me try again. Okay, hopefully that'll be a bit better. How was that? Can you see it? Yes, I can see your PowerPoint. So Dr. Johan Bell is the Senior Director, Pacific Tuna Fisheries at Conservation International and a visiting professorial fellow at the Australian National Center for Ocean Resources and Security at the University of Wollongong. Prior to joining Conservation International and ANCORS, Johan worked for the Pacific Community in New Caledonia, where he led an assessment of the vulnerability of fisheries and aquaculture in the Pacific Island region to climate change. He is now leading the development of a proposal to the Green Climate Fund on behalf of 14 Pacific Island countries entitled Adaptations for Two Independent Pacific Island Communities and Economies to Climate Change. The proposal to Green Climate Fund is a joint effort between Conservation International, the Pacific Community, the Pacific Islands Forum Fisheries Agency, FAO, and the Secretariat of the Pacific Regional Environmental Program. So Johan will now share his work on socioeconomic impacts of climate-driven tuna redistribution in the Pacific Ocean. Thank you very much, Leah. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to you, and hello, everyone. <clears throat> well, as you can see, this, this presentation is going to differ a bit from the two previous ones, and that I'm really going to focus on the socioeconomic impacts of climate-driven <clears throat> tuna redistribution in the Pacific Ocean. And uh, I'd just like to lead you through, you know, why this is such an important issue for Pacific Island countries and territories. Now, this map here um, shows you data from the Forum Fisheries Agency. And it's just for one year, but it's, I think you'll agree that it's, it's fairly dramatic. Those figures there in yellow 
are the percentage of all government revenue that is derived from access fees sold to distant water fishing nations to come in the EZs of these countries and fish for tuna. And as you can see, in the case of Papua New Guinea, that's got a very large economy, even though a lot of fishing is done there, the contribution to government revenue is, is only around 5%. But please look at some of the other countries. I mean, obviously, the most extreme is the small territory of Tokelau, where the license fees make up more than 90% of all their government revenue. But you have several countries there that derive 50 to 60% uh, of their government revenue from this source. But tuna is not only important to these countries as a source of government revenue, it's actually very important for food security. And some estimates have been made that by 2035, 25% um, of all fish eaten in the region will need to come from tuna. And the, region, the reason for that is, is that the populations are, growing, populations are growing quickly. Um, but reefs are unable to provide any more fish. Uh, they're going to provide less fish because they're degrading and it's going to degrade under climate change. So tuna is going to be vital for food security in the future. It's also very important for employment. You know, close to 25,000 people in the region derive their full-time employment either by working in fish processing, tuna processing, or working on tuna vessels. Now, not surprisingly, given the, the huge importance of tuna um, to economies and um, communities in the region, the leaders of Pacific Island countries uh, back in 2015 with the assistance of the Forum Fisheries Agency and Pacific Community uh, developed a regional roadmap for sustainable Pacific fisheries. This roadmap has four main goals. Obviously to sustain the tuna resources that deliver all these benefits, but wherever possible to continue to add value to tuna, to increase the number of jobs, uh, <clears throat> derived from tuna, and importantly, to begin to allocate more tuna for domestic food security for the reasons that I've explained earlier. Well, it's very pleasing to be able to tell you that um, the sustainability goal of the roadmap is actually being achieved. As you can see here from this um, latest graph that's with, been updated to, for data for this year by the Pacific community. None of the tuna species that are harvested in the region uh, is overfished and none is currently subject to overfishing. And this I'm talking about in the Western and Central Pacific Ocean here. But the important point is that 50% you know, of the, the catch from the Western Central Pacific Ocean actually comes from the eight exclusive economic zones uh, shown here on the map in blue. Now, these eight countries actually account for uh, Ninety-five percent of all the tuna caught uh, in the Pacific Island region, and the eight countries um, are, are what's known as the the parties to the Nauru Agreement, and they manage their per seine fishery um, under a, a fishing effort scheme, the the vessel day scheme. Now, this is actually a, a, a wonderful, effective fisheries management. Um, system and it's what's particularly good about it is that it already accounts for the effect of climatic variability on tuna catch. As you can see in this graphic here um, supplied by the scientists from the Pacific community uh, under El Nino conditions when the trade winds are blowing particularly strongly um, and the trade winds compress the Western Pacific warm pool which is shown here in the sort of light brownie color on the right hand side, it compresses the warm pool in the west of the region. Most of the Persane fishing effort occurs in places like Papua New Guinea and Nauru and the Federated States of Micronesia. However, you know, when the trade winds slacken off under El Nino conditions and the Western Pacific warm pool, you know, expands significantly to the east, the location of the best uh, the locations where the best catch rates are made, you know, actually uh, go well to the east and they can be actually up to 4,000 kilometers apart. 
the prime fishing zones between a strong La Nina and a strong El Nino event. And so what the Vessel Day Scheme does is that it's actually developed a, a cap and trade approach to all this. What these eight countries have done is that they've, taught, they've sought scientific advice um, from, the, from the Pacific community. Uh, you know, how, how much fishing effort in terms of per se and vessel days can be uh, expended each year to keep catches sustainable. And it's roughly in the order of about 45,000 vessel days a year. And then the eight members allocate those um, days to themselves based on the last eight to 10 years of catch history. And so just as an example, you know, strong La Nina event, when most of the vessels want to fish in Papua New Guinea's waters, you know, once Papua New Guinea has used up all its allocated days, a provision can then be made for the fleets to purchase days from those countries further to the east, where the vessels don't want to fish that year. And then that enables the vessels to keep fishing where catch rates are best in the west. And the beauty of this scheme is that regardless of where the fish are caught in any one year, each of the members here continues to get a, a flow of income that year. So, you know, I, I think it's a wonderful example, probably a world leading example of cooperative fishy, fisheries management to deal with the effects of climatic variability on the distribution of tuna. But there's a really, um, key question that's emerging now. And that question is, you know, will climate change disrupt the socioeconomic benefits derived from the, the vessel day scheme? And recently, um, the partners involved in this project, and I, sorry, I should have announced them on my first slide there, I had the logos, there are it's Conservation International, but it's also the Pacific Community and the Forum Fisheries Agency, and the, the group that um, the Pacific Community works with in France, uh, CLS, particularly Ina Sanina and Patrick Lahode, who do the modeling, and the University of Wollongong have um, produced a policy brief, actually, uh, 12 months or so ago, to summarize uh, the situation and to raise some of the concerns. So, and the modeling that was done for that exercise, and here you see some graphics just uh, for skipjack tuna, the dominant species in the Persane catch. And this modeling is showing that under a high emission scenario, RCP 8.5 by 2050, that something like 10% of the um, bi tuna biomass in the combined EEZs of the 8 P and 8 countries is likely to move from their jurisdictions into high seas areas. And that equates to um, loss of catches from their waters in the order of about 140,000 tonnes a year. Now this has got really dramatic implications uh, for the economies of these countries if things actually play out this way. So by 2050, that sort of relocation of biomass from the EZs into high seas areas would actually result in a combined loss of about $60 million a year for the eight PNA members. And as you'll see from this graph here, and if you, for instance, take the Federated States of Micronesia there, um, with 26% reduction in the catch, but it would actually translate to almost a 15% drop in total government revenue be because of this fact that the access fees make up such a large proportion of government revenue. As you can see from this graphic, I mean, most of the countries <clears throat> um, are, going to, are projected to uh, lose revenue, but not surprisingly in the far east or, or much further to the east, um, the, uh, the Lion Islands, uh, EEZ within Kiribati and, uh, and Cook Islands, um, it's actually at the same time, this particular modeling exercise demonstrated that there was likely to be an increase in the biomass of tuna further to the east. So those countries would potentially be winners, whereas the other ones would be losers under this, under this modeling. 
I'd just like to spend a few minutes uh, talking about the implications for food security. Um, and interestingly, we're not so concerned about uh, what the redistribution of tuna will do to access to tuna for coastal communities. I and mean, what's happening now is that uh, countries are being encouraged to uh, put in these nearshore fish aggregating devices uh, as a way of continuing to have access to fish as coral reefs are degraded by climate change. But even if, for argument's sake, you take Papua New Guinea, and you might have noticed on the graph that I showed you that the model is indicating that there'd be almost a 40% uh, decrease in the biomass of tuna in PNG by 2050. But because the catches are so large in Papua New Guinea, I mean, averaging between 400 and 500,000 tons a year, even a 40% decrease in that biomass is still gonna leave a lot of tuna biomass in their waters and so no real problems are envisaged so far as coastal communities being able to go out and get reasonable access to, to tuna for their own food security. However, for some of the urban communities in the region, I'm thinking particularly of a place like Honiara in the Solomon Islands, which relies heavily on fish coming ashore during transshipping operations to provide cheap sources of protein for a quite a rapidly growing urban centre. As the tuna move further to the east, we may well expect um, some redistribution of where transshipping activity occurs. And so unless something is done to, for argument's sake, um, mandate a minimum number of tram shipments in places like that, there could well be a decrease in the availability of protein uh, for rapidly growing urban populations. So I've just got two more slides and I'd just like to, the first one is lead you through uh, some you know, important policy considerations here. I think from what I've been able to talk to you about today, I think it's clear that Pacific Island countries are actually in a good position to seek assistance, to find solutions that will enable them to retain the benefits that they presently receive from tuna, regardless of the impact of climate change. I mean, Think of it this way, Pacific Island countries, you know, I think have the moral authority here in the sense that we've demonstrated that they are tuna dependent economies, and yet they have made negligible contributions to greenhouse gas emissions. And so there's a real case for climate justice here, uh, for the countries to be able to go and negotiate internationally to retain the benefits that they've always enjoyed and that they actually hope to build on further uh, through the regional roadmap. But a couple of important things are needed to assist the countries to do those negotiations. And one is actually uh, continuing to improve the tuna models. I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty associated with these models. And I think you're going to hear later in your meeting from Patrick Lahode, and he'll be able to lead you through what some of the sources of uncertainty are. But we need to be able to reduce that uncertainty. We need, need to be able to identify with much greater accuracy um, the timing and the extent of tuna redistribution so that these countries can be very well equipped to go in and have these negotiations with the best possible information at their disposal. And the final slide is just to, to let you know that the, the stage is actually being set for improved modelling. At the meeting of the Western Central Pacific Fisheries Commission last year, the general meeting, uh, a resolution on climate change was passed. And part of the wording of that resolution was pointing to the fact that, you know, we need to consider the impacts of climate change on fish stocks in the convention area and any related socioeconomic impacts. And uh, as Leah kindly mentioned in the introduction, the region is, is in the process of preparing a very major proposal to the Green Climate Fund. Um, entitled Adapting Tuna Dependent Pacific Island Communities and Economies to Climate Change. And a key part of that proposal is actually to develop uh, an advanced warning system that will give the countries the information that they need to negotiate with competence. And what's gonna be happening as part of that is that for the first time, we're gonna look at 
try to make the, the modeling much more nuanced than it has been in the past. Up until this point in time, the Cepidine model has been applied on the assumption that each of the tuna species forms one big panmictic stock across the whole tropical Pacific Ocean. But recent research by, excuse me, by CSIRO and others has demonstrated that for big eye and for yellowfin at least, uh, that's certainly not the case. There's good evidence now that there are multiple self-replenishing stocks of tuna. Now we don't know what the full stock structure looks like, but we believe we have to identify that and then each population can be modeled and we can build up a much better idea of what the redistribution of tuna is going to look like through that. And there are other ways of improving the models too. Obviously, increasing the spatial resolution, um, developing ocean forcings for the other uh, emission scenarios, RCP 4.5 and 2.6, and actually integrating you know, improved uh, biogeochemical models for the impacts of ocean warming and ocean acidification on the food webs that support tuna into Cepidine. Would just be some examples of how we can reduce uncertainty with the current modeling approach. And a final thing that's happening, and many of you will be aware of this, I guess, is that um, the Global Environmental Facility, uh, together with FAO, um, are developing a second phase of the Common Oceans program. And there will be some funds available to begin to do this, not only for the Pacific, but for all oceans, and, and particularly improving the resolution of the tuna models, but also developing the ocean forcings for the different emission scenarios for all oceans. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Johan, uh, for reviewing the socioeconomic impacts, um, climate change in the Pacific, and why we need the science that we are reviewing today and that we'll cover in the following sessions. Um, so now I welcome our presenters to turn on their cameras. And we have about 20 minutes for um, discussion. So I will read the first hey, question. You, that's... Could I just give my apologies, please? Try as I may, I cannot turn my camera on. So I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> no worries. Thanks for trying, Johan. Um, so I'll read the first question that's posted in the chat. Um, and after that, if you have a question, feel free to turn your camera on and your mic on. So the first question I have here is for Maite from Alessandro Lovatelli. Um, is it an expansion of the distribution areas or a change in the distribution area? Yeah, thank you. I already answered him in a private chat. <laughs> I say that uh, they are both. They are changing the distribution, but also like an expansion to the poles that's what, that we found for the, or what, what can we expect in the future with our models? Great, thank you. Um, and now the floor is open for questions. Um, see if, you, if you have a question, uh, you can unmute yourself and go ahead and, and ask anything for the panelists. I have a question. Um, I wanted to see what the panelists thought about the, the example that we were just shown for the management in the Pacific. Do you think that there is a potential opportunity to do similar management of tuna stocks in, in other regions? And are, what are the challenges with doing so? Any takers? I don't know who's uh, who's uh, whose question is that, and to whom it has been uh, asked. But I, I did not understand very well. The, the sound was not that good.
Uh, so there's a question. Welcome to any of the panelists uh, to see if um, some of the, the management structures that are being used in the Pacific could be used in the Indian Ocean or, or elsewhere. Yeah, again, again, uh, so what, what's what's the question? Is it about the uh, the, the trade to these uh, major investments which were made on these uh, uh, island states? Is that the question? Hey, 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 Francis, it's about the, the vessel day scheme that uh, Bill, uh, Joan, Joan uh, just showed, uh, how that can apply to Indian Ocean. And uh, I think that's, that's an interesting question that I don't have an answer. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's completely different. Uh, I mean, the Indian Ocean is, is completely different than what, what you see in, in the Pacific Island in terms of collaborations and partnership and co-management. So, Francis, you may have more things to say about that. Yeah, actually, um, uh, definitely, the, when we, we focus on the island states, most of them are located in the west or central uh, Indian Ocean. We don't have island states on the, on the east side. But nevertheless, there are very big players in tuna industry in the east, which is Indonesia, obviously. And um, we can see that the, the, the changes which are projected will uh, gradually lead to a, a shift on the part of the tuna biomass to the, to the east of the Indian Ocean. So definitely, um, I think they, again, a bit like uh, Johanna has uh, shown in the, in the Pacific, uh, we, we have winners and we have losers. Now the, the idea is just maybe to work better through the IOTC. We already have a, a groups of countries called the G16, which um, are actually have the same interest. There are coastal countries which want to differentiate from the uh, distant water fisheries nations and to raise their interest. I think in this context, um, the, the, the project it changes in this uh, redistribution or of changes in the, in the core uh, areas for, for, for fishing ground can be a great interest in this, uh, in this potential negotiations. Uh, but again, at the IOTC for the moment, we don't consider uh, very much uh, the, the, this, um, this uh, variability in the, in the climate condition. I think this will come gradually and maybe this will give us more insights to how to better adapt the management to, to, to this. But definitely we don't have in the Indian Ocean the same, uh, um, the same pattern in terms of uh, countries uh, connection that uh, we have in the in Pacific Island. Great, thank you. I have a question from Anton Ellenbrook. Um, this is open to the panelists. Are there plans to align with the UN Decade of Ocean Science or Digital Ocean or other large public e infrastructures? Maybe I can give a part of the answer because I'm part of the scientific committee of the GOOS and we are presently working quite hard in designing a, a program uh, for, the, uh, for the decade, uh, the decade of the ocean science. And um, we are actually investigating various components. One is the, the local stakeholders. How can we better engage with the stakeholders, which are the private sectors and the governments especially in the developing uh, countries. And um, I think uh, this uh, issue of uh, climate impacts on, on fisheries uh, will rank uh, high on the agenda of the, of the decade. We are already working on that at the, uh, at the level of goose. So I think this will, uh, this will be uh, pushed uh, in, the, in, the, in the decade program, uh, presumably. Leah, I'd be happy to make a comment there. I mean, we don't have any formal arrangements at, at this time, but I'd be very surprised if um, information coming from the, the program wouldn't be of assistance for argument's sake in, in implementing the Green Climate Fund proposal, assuming we're successful as a region in, in obtaining the funding. I mean, for instance, if any work was being done um, to quantify with acoustics um, through industrial fishing fleets to, to build up a much 
better picture of the of the micronecton, uh, the tuna food, and how it's responding to climate change. That would definitely strengthen, you know, CPDIME as a tool uh, for for modelling. So I think it's something we certainly need to. Uh, look at all the dimensions of it. And as I say, I wouldn't be at all surprised if there could be great synergies there. Thank you. I don't know if Olivier Mori is, uh, is online um, because he is the, he's the developer of Apicosm. And actually they have uh, worked extensively on how to relate this uh, science, uh, science outputs into, uh, into uh, economies and uh, and uh, you know how this uh, management of the tuna resource could be shared. I don't know if Olivier is online. Maybe he can give some insights. Maybe he's left the meeting. I don't know. But definitely, yeah. Yeah, Olivier, go ahead. Uh, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'm online, but I, actually I did not listen carefully to the question. So if you could please just repeat it for me. Um, so Anton Allenbroek from FAO here, I'm working more on digital infrastructures than on uh, on fisheries analysis. But uh, the, my question is, uh, so I, I see a lot of very, well, super interesting um, approaches to forecast fisheries along uh, climate change but uh, i also see a sort of as a fragmentation and i know there is this uh, big un decade of ocean sign being uh, very heavily promoted and of course there is a big overlap with fisheries there but the, do you see a an effort in that ocean decade or other initiatives where people try to work more uh, towards open science and having the models and the data brought uh, into uh, open cloud platforms and making the analysis more accessible or interactive for, for instance, local governments that do not have their own resources to run all these analyses. Uh, yes, uh, there is actually um, a community-based effort, uh, which is the FishMIP, which is a model into a comparison uh, initiative and, and the goal of FishMIP is actually exactly what you're saying is to bring together uh, several uh, modeling tools at the moment we have something like nine global models running in this project and we are actually just now uh, updating the, the runs the, the new runs so this has been developed in the IPCC framework uh, you know like like many uh, large global model inter comparison projects and and, and you are certainly aware of the, the climate models uh, intercomparison, which is providing the, the global climate ensembles that, that are used in the IPCC report. And we are just doing exactly the same with ecosystem models and fisheries models at the moment. So this is, this is completely open, uh, both open to new participants and, and, and modeling teams. And the results are also supposed to be completely uh, accessible in a transparent way. Uh, so you can have a look at the fish big fish big, sorry uh, project website, and and we are in the progress. It, it is quite new. It is it is uh, still a new initiative. It is only uh, something like four or five years uh, old initiative, and we are in the process of uh, you know upgrading the models, upgrading the simulations continuously, uh, and including also bioeconomic components for fisheries. And, and moving to a more details, for instance, uh, during the last round of simulations, there was only global biomass uh, in the sea considered. And now we are splitting with uh, explicitly uh, open ocean large predators, small pelagics, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And, and so we are moving to a more realistic models, uh, more validated approaches, and, 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 and the more models we have, the better ID we can have about the uncertainty attached to these these projections. Uh, so I think FishMIP is definitely a good candidate for for being a project in in the uh, IOC uh, decade or you know ocean. Uh, I can't I can't remember the name of this. Uh, but, uh, 
So, and, and Anton, I have a, a little bit answer for you, but uh, not, not really related to mostly the fisheries. I, I am involved in several of these decade um, uh, questions, and but mostly in the term of ocean observing systems and uh, ocean models. Uh, and so, uh, I would say I didn't see much going on in terms of uh, putting all those models uh, from from fisheries and uh, in in the same way as what. Uh, the ocean observing system community are doing so they are a little bit lagged behind again uh, as you can probably <laughs> may be aware of um uh, but those initiatives seem like uh, like as we go forward with the the decade um we, we start seeing more of this interest uh, to get uh, you know up to speed those other communities uh, to tag along and and try to you know to figure out what to do next because i think the biodiversity community is is really strong and coming together but um, um, it, there is a lot of work to be done for the fisheries community i mean at least the the, the modeling community and, and i think that's probably something that we have to start thinking about more as we see this decade moving forward i will stop there thanks yeah, catchability of fishermen is difficult, yes. Definitely, that's what uh, some of, of these things uh, um, always been behind in terms of putting things on the web or, or uh, the cloud, as you said. And, and some of them are saying, why cloud? We don't need the cloud. <laughs> it's, not, it's not the cloud that is going to enable us to do things that we want to do. But, but anyway, there is a lot of argument even about using the cloud for even ocean models and all these things. So, so uh, there's a lot of things going on. I, I can see that there will be a lot of debate about the cloud itself, even the cloud. And we have all these strategies in NOAA, uh, where I am, and there is a lot of contentious debate about uh, using the cloud um, infrastructure. So, so anyhow, stop yeah, but there. Uh, yeah, then just to, for people that may not understand how it works, uh, it is very different to run an ecosystem model and to tell a fisherman to stop fishing. So there's this huge gap between scientific uh, analysis that may be good or maybe less good. Right. But that is there in the open, and then to take a decision on to to anchor a fleet and to tell people to stop fishing. So there's a, and that is, I think, the where the mismatch, or it's not the mismatch, but where the discussion with the fisheries community often is. Yes. Right. Right. Now uh, we have, I mean, this, the first things that we are doing is to set up those sandboxes. Um, mm -hmm. Those sandboxes are bringing really people together. Uh, to, 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 to basically bring the data, bring the model, run the models in the cloud. And there, of course, there's a lot of benefit in there. The only problem there, there is still challenge with, with these companies that are providing those clouds, uh, Amazon and others. Uh, you know, there is, there is still work to be done there in that site. So. Hey, thank you. Um, we do have a couple more comments in the chat. Um, first from Fabienne, asking if you could give some web references on the models and the project behind. And Maite um, posted a link. Could you tell us a little more about um, the link that you shared? Uh, no, I'm just new in this uh, intermodal comparison project. And I just put the website a link. And also, uh, I think, Maybe there are some newer uh, papers, but the one from Tintesor in 2018, and I think there is uh, a full description of the of the panel, and you can find more more information there. Yeah, I think I think um, the the models which are uh, taken up in the uh, fish meat that uh, Olivier just mentioned earlier. I think it's well documented, and uh, I don't have it with me at the moment, but uh, probably Olivier will be able to send um, a link where we can find all the, the list of models, because it's now it's a, it's a very formal process, so mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's it can be found somewhere, definitely. And uh, there is also the question of uh, whether the model development includes the very uh, coastal uh, environments. I would say that... Um, um, 
for the moment, the, the resolution, the special uh, resolution of the models uh, only allows to work in the open ocean. Uh, now getting very close to the coast and especially in such a particular environment as uh, coral reefs and mangroves, um, that's more difficult to, to, to connect because you need to put some kind of understand some kind of relationship between those the coast and what's happening in the in the in the open ocean. So I, I, I don't think for the moment this uh, very uh, local interaction between coral reefs and mangroves towards the ocean can be modeled but maybe if someone has another opinion but to me i think it's we are not at this stage of, uh, of modeling that's it for me and um, i also had another one from the last year i think it's also with those results but if someone has more Yeah, there's a comment here in the chat um, from Fabian um, about work in the Euro European Commission, and it's difficult to know where to start inventorying relevant models or species of priorities. There's anyone here that could speak to how we could best inventory this type of information? Yeah, I, I think the best is to to check on the FishBeep website. Uh, it is. It is more or less updated uh, frequently. Uh, so you will have the, the, the latest publications, the list of models, the, the people to contact. Uh, actually, I'm involved in the steering committee of, of this project. And uh, I can give you uh, more details if, if needed uh, about the procedures. And 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 we, we can also organize specific community rounds of simulations on specific questions if needed. Uh, to address specific problems. Uh, regarding the link with the coral reef, co you know, the, the interactions between coral reef fisheries and, and oceanic fisheries, uh, we haven't tackled that uh, at all yet in the models uh, because it's too high resolution uh, for our models. Sorry. It's too high resolution for all models. Uh, at the moment, the models are running based on, on output from climate models, which are uh, provided at one degree resolution. So it is it is not uh, allowing us to 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 address you know high resolution coastal uh, issues like this one. Does that help? We have time for one more question. So not really an inventory of models, but Emily, would you like to speak on um, our work with Anton in creating a, a information hub for fishery services? Um, yes, yeah, thank you, Leah. So as, as part of the Geo Blue Planet Fisheries Working Group, we are working to put together an, an uh, online um, interactive inventory of tools that are based on earth observations that can be used for fisheries applications um, and so we'll include some information about you know some of these activities in that and we'll, we'll be sharing that with everyone um, we'll also be compiling a workshop report from this workshop and we'll be sure to include some information about the, the various models and other aspects that people had questions about and if there's anything else that you are interested in um, feel free to to reach out with us and we'll be happy to uh, talk with you offline. Um, and I'll just put our contact information in the chat. And I just want to say thank you for all the speakers that joined us today. I think you've done a great job presenting the work just all over the, the world um, and really given us a foundation on why earth observations why we need earth observations for tuna management and the different areas and fisheries and socioeconomic um, issues that we hope that earth observations can address and i think this is a great start to the rest of the sessions um, coming up in the future so if you are interested in hearing more about how earth observations are used in fisheries generally and how they could be applied to tuna fisheries specifically um, please visit our website, um, geobluplanet.org, 
slash EO Fortuna um, and join us for future sessions. So thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Yeah. Bye.